Well, good morning, Mission City. If you have your Bible or a copy of God's Word or your phone or your tablet, please take it out and turn to Daniel chapter 3. If you're still bookmarked there from Daniel chapter 1, last week you're, you're already ahead of the game. If you find Psalms and go to the right a little bit, you'll be there pretty quick. But while you're turning there, let me introduce myself. My name is Paul Stoller. Uh, my family and I just moved down here uh, in January, and uh, my beautiful wife, Michelle, my two amazing kiddos, Jonathan and Maddie, and uh, I came to work with the Southern Baptists of Texas Convention. I left a pastorate of eight years in northwestern Oklahoma, born and raised Texan, so it's good to be back. Amen. Amen. Yeah, you can clap for that. I clap for that. I got emotional seeing all the Texas flags when we were coming here. Um, and so uh, we're, we're blessed to be here. And, I, and so on behalf of Dr. Richards and our new exec, Dr. Lorick, I want to say thank you for your support. But I get to work with pastors and churches, SBTC pastors and churches from west of Kendall County, south of I-20. So it's kind of a big area, but I love it and enjoy it. Um, but when we came, uh, we were in a meeting and uh, Mark said, I said jokingly kind, I need to find a house in San Antonio area. And he said, my pastor's wife is a realtor. And so we got connected with Becky Serber, and she sold us a beautiful home. And she is, a, of course, as you know, a sweetheart. And as we were looking for homes, she told us about homes, but she also told us about a church, Mission City. And you know that, right? And, uh, and so we had to come. And so we tried Mission City. We got to choose where we wanted to go worship, of course. And our kids got plugged in and loved it. Uh, my wife, Michelle, and I got plugged in. And we have, on, honestly, in the last few months, has just fell in love with Mission City. And this week, uh, we actually became covenant members. And uh, yeah, so we're excited to be here. Thank you. We attend the, the Northwest campus every week, um, but it is just a blessing. And uh, let me tell you why I joined real quick. Um, why we joined. I, one, I feel that I got three points because I'm a preacher. Uh, I, I feel the presence of God here. I've come to Central Campus and worshiped. I feel God here. Northwest Campus, you just feel God. When you feel God, that's something to take hold of. Then the people, we got plugged into a life group. Our life group is amazing. Um, they took care of us during the snowpocalypse, right? They're bringing us water. We had just moved. Um, they're taking care of us, texting me this morning, this, this weekend, and telling me they're praying for me. It just means so much. In fact, uh, uh, Mark and Lydia offered their home before we even came, offered their home for us to come and stay and look at homes while we were coming here. It's just amazing. And then when we were looking for a church, for me, I look for a church that preaches the word of God, and we found it here at Mission City. Pastor Matt opens up the word every single week and preaches the truth every single week. In fact, everyone's good. I told him, I texted him the other week and I said, can you stop knocking it out of the park every week? You're making us all look bad. Um, but he hasn't. So, I mean, I don't know what else to do. Um, and uh, not only is he a, a great communicator and preacher of God's word, he and his family are amazing. Um, but he uh, is a good leader, a great leader. And uh, I'm excited about the vision that God has given him for our church and what God is already doing and what he's going to do. And I told him, I said, you know, I just want to be a part of that vision. And so whatever I can do, I'm here to follow your leadership and just see God do great things. So we are excited. Uh, so let's dive in to Daniel chapter 3. We're going to spend uh, all of our time here looking at several uh, passages and verses. So let's have a word of prayer and, uh, and we'll get started. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for all that you've done for us. We thank you for your grace and mercy. God, I'm so grateful that we can build our life on you. And then you, we find hope, we find peace, we find salvation, and we find rest. God, would you speak to us this morning through your word and through your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Well, I grew up in North Houston. My dad was on staff at a church in North Houston for 36 years. So I was an ornery staff kid. Um, and one of the things, when I was 16 years old, I worked at my church. During the week, we would do, I mean, we would do maintenance and things like that, and we would clean and mop and all that good stuff. But on Saturdays, we would do all the odds and ends. We would uh, mow the yard and then do all these other things. And one of the things we loved as a 16-year-old is the burn pile, okay? Now, when you're 16 years old, you're automatically a pyromaniac. It's just the way it is. If your kid tells you he's not... Check yourself, because it's true. We all just want to burn stuff at 16. I don't know what it is, but it's in there. It's ingrained in us. And so uh, we just love the burn pile. But my boss, we were 16, 17 years old, several of us, my boss liked to take two-hour lunches at Luby's. 
And so when he took those lunches and left us unsupervised, that was not good. And, uh, and so we, would, uh, we, we got the burn pile going. We we're supposed to use diesel, watch it burn kind of slow. That's not happening. We're using gas, watching it blow up, throwing in paint cans to see where they explode and if they'll hit anybody. I know, I just, we were 16, it's okay. Um, and, and so uh, all of that happened. And, and so one day in July, it was a dry time there in North Houston, and uh, we saw some things we needed to burn, and it was a piano. And I know you pianists, you're like, how dare you? I know, it was, it was okay, it was trash. And so we were like, yes, we get to burn this. This is going to be amazing. And so we put it on the burn pile. Then we also find this carpet padding, which here's what we learned later is that that absorbs a lot of heat and becomes super hot. Didn't know that, we're 16, okay? And so we throw that on the burn pile. We pour our gas on, boom, it explodes. It is awesome, best day ever. Until out of the corner of my eye, I see these little fires start popping up on the dry grass. Oh my goodness, my life flashes before my eyes. We're burning down the back 40, we're burning down the church. I can't come home, my life is over, right? So I was like, oh no. So I run, I get in the truck, go down, get, find a hose. We, go, we come back, we're spraying water on it before our boss even gets there, right? We're unsupervised still at this point. And we start spraying water and thankfully the fire goes out. Whew. But as I approached this text this week and I began to think, you know, sometimes in life, little fires, they kind of pick up, don't they? Maybe this week you're walking through a fire. Maybe this week, this weekend even, you were, you, you were fighting with your spouse all weekend. And you're in the midst of this fire and you've come this week, today, you've come this weekend to Mission City and, and you're saying, Paul, I don't know if I can handle this anymore. I don't know what I can do. I'm walking through a fire. Maybe... The bills are piling up and you couldn't pay the one on the bottom and they just keep adding up and up and up. And you're thinking, I don't know how we can afford this. How can we do this? And you're walking through a fire. Maybe recently you got a call from a doctor and you got some results that you weren't expecting to hear. And all of a sudden you're thrown into the fire. And so this morning, I want us to look at this question. Can I trust God in the fire? Can I trust God in the fire? Maybe that's a question you're asking. Maybe it's a question you've asked before. But we're going to look at the text this morning and see how the word of God answers that question. Past two weeks we've been talking about trust, right? Pastor Matt uh, brilliantly laid out how we can trust God. And then last week how we can trust God in all areas of our life and how uh, influence is very important. And today I want to talk about this, walking through the fire. Look, we've all walked through the fire. This is relevant to all of us, isn't it, for the past year? Did anybody see coronavirus coming? No. You've been affected by it. Maybe you've been in a hospital. You've had it. You've had loved ones or friends pass away from it. It's horrible. Financially, you've been hit. We've all walked through the fire. So let's see what the Word of God says. Daniel chapter 3, I'm going to catch you up here just for a minute on where we are in this story. Babylon, Babylon was kind of the uh, world superpower at the time. They had uh, overtaken God's people, uh, the Israelites, uh, south uh, Israel, the, where Jerusalem was. And, and so they pulled them all into captivity. And they, uh, they put Daniel and some of his friends in, in, uh, in the government to see what would happen. And we talked about Daniel, Pastor Matt talked about Daniel uh, last week. And he had three friends, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And these are men who walked with God. And the, the king, King Nebuchadnezzar, he was an egomaniac, right? He had just, he was on a power trip and he decided to do this. He was going to build a nine to 11 story statue overlaid or even in pure gold, we're not sure, overlaid in gold for everyone to worship. That's who this guy is. And so he built this statue, nine stories. And what an awesome way to spend money from the government, right? And so he, he builds this statue and he has this idea he's going to uh, have everybody come out when there are all these music instruments are, are played and everybody comes out, everybody in the, in the whole nation is gonna come out and bow and worship this idol. And here's how good this guy is, that's sarcastic, okay? He says, you can choose to worship me and you can choose to worship this idol, but if you don't, there's a furnace right over there and it's burning and we're going to throw you in. So isn't that a loving guy, right? But you see the opposite. Hold on a second. Compare it to God. God doesn't force you to worship him or love him. He wants you to choose to. And so there's no furnace. Like this is who, you see the difference here? So Nebuchadnezzar is evil, right? He's the bad guy of the story. 
And Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they're not having it. They know the first commandment of the 10. Thou shalt what? Have no other gods before me. So they're not having it. They're not worshiping and they don't. But there's some jealous men in the government. I, they, I think they're jealous because Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego probably got the promotion that they wanted. And so they're jealous, and so they go and tattle to Nebuchadnezzar. And so Nebuchadnezzar is upset. Let's pick it up. We're going to walk through the story starting in verse 13. It says, Then Nebuchadnezzar, in a furious rage, commanded that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego be brought. So they brought these men before the king. Nebuchadnezzar answered and said to them, is it true, O Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you do not serve my gods, isn't that awesome, look, my gods, or worship the golden image that what? I have set up. Now, if you are ready, when you hear the sound of the horn, the pipe, the lyre, trigon, harp, bagpipe, right? No one wants to hear the sound of the bagpipe, right? Sorry if that, well, anyway. Okay, so, and every kind of music, to fall down and worship the image that I have made, well and good. But if you do not worship, you shall immediately be cast into a burning, fiery furnace. Isn't that awesome? They say fiery furnace. You have to put fire in front of furnace? See what Daniel's trying to say? You don't say, like, go swimming in the wet pool, right? Okay? It's, it's, just, it's just we're seeing how, how bad this is. He says, you will immediately be cast into a burning, fiery furnace. And who is God who will deliver you out of my hands? So Nebuchadnezzar is saying there's no one bigger, no one greater, no one has more power than me, and I'm going to prove it. And he says, maybe you missed it. Hey, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, maybe you missed it. You didn't hear the bagpipes, right? Whoever, however you can do that, right? And so maybe you missed it. And so now I'm going to give you another opportunity to bow down and worship. So Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they enter the story here, and they speak. They say this, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, Oh, Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to answer you in this matter. But if this be so, our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us from the burning, fiery furnace. And he will deliver us out of your hand, O king. But if not, be it known to you, O king, that we will not serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. What are they saying? They are men who are committed to God, period. They're saying thanks, but no thanks. We appreciate that you want to give us another opportunity, but we don't need it. We've decided in our hearts that we're not going to worship you or any other God. Here's what they say. They say this. They say, look, we know there's a furnace over there, but our God has more power than the furnace or anything. And so listen, if we go into that furnace and we burn up and die, we go to heaven and be with our God. We're fine with that. Or if God decides to deliver us because he's able to, he's more powerful, then great. We live too. They're more fearful of what God would do than what man will do to them. Amen. Now, let me just take a minute and do a little bit of teaching, okay? Because I want us to understand something. Because there's a prosperity gospel flying around. It's on our Christian TV sometimes. And here's what it says. It says this. It says, if you have enough faith, you can control God and you can get God to do what you want. That's basically what they say. But that's not in scripture. See, I wish I could stay here and say, God will deliver you from every fire. He may not. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they knew that. They're like, it may not fall into God's plan or God's will. But if he delivers us, great. If he doesn't, okay, we'll go to heaven. That's fine. You see, we can be faithful people and still die in the fire. My grandparents are all in heaven. I believe they're in heaven. And they walk through some cancer. My grandmothers walk through some cancer. And I tell you, if anybody had enough faith to make it through it, it was them. But for some reason, God took them to heaven. And you know what? As much as I didn't want them here, I'm glad they're not here sometimes of <laughs> what we go through, right? That they're in heaven with Jesus. So God is able to get us through the fire. It's up to him. Shout out Meshach and Abednego knew that, right? So now Nebuchadnezzar, let's go to verse 19. Nebuchadnezzar, he's angry, right? He's filled with fury, and the expression on his face has changed against Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. He ordered the furnace heated seven times more than it was usually heated. What we think of scholars believe that could be around 1,000 degrees, which um, I don't, I mean, I'm, I'm not smart, so I Googled something, and it, that's about the, as hot as lava. So that's pretty hot, okay, right? 
And uh, he ordered the furnace to be heated seven times hotter than it's usually heated. Verse 20. And he ordered some of his mighty men of his army to bind Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and to cast them into the burning, fiery furnace. Then these men were bound in their cloaks, their tunics, their hats, their other garments, and they were thrown into the burning, fiery furnace. So there they go. Verse 22. Because the king's order was urgent and the furnace overheated, the flame of the king, uh, the flame of the fire killed those men who took up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. So he lost some of his best men right now. And these three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, fell bound into the burning, fiery furnace. So now they're in the midst of it. But what happens? Verse 24. Then King Nebuchadnezzar was astonished and rose up in haste, and he declared to his counselors, did we not cast three men bound into the fire? Isn't that weird? Like, we just saw it, king. I think they're about to answer, duh, right? Fact check. Wasn't there three? I'm not good at math, but wasn't there three people that we threw in? Why? Look what happens. They answered and said to the king, true, O king. He answered and said, but I see four men unbound, walking in the midst of the fire, and they are not hurt, and the appearance of the fourth is what? Like a son of the gods. So here's what Nebuchadnezzar is putting together. He thought he was over there wringing his hands and going, oh, we got them now, we'll show them. And all of a sudden now, they're unbound, walking around with a fourth. And who is that? Someone who looks like the son of the gods. Now we have to remember, this is from Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar is not a believer. Who is this? Is this an angel? Some scholars say this is an angel. If so, that's, I'm okay with that too because that means God still showed up. But here's what I believe, and a lot of scholars agree with me. Just kidding. I agree with them, right? <laughs> is that this is Jesus Christ pre-incarnate here with them. What does that mean? That's a big word. It means before Jesus came in the New Testament, before he put on flesh. I believe there's several times in the Old Testament where Jesus Christ showed up with his people. This is one of them. So the creator of the world, the God who threw the stars into space, named them. He is walking with them in the fire. And they're walking around unbound. What are they doing? Are they singing Build My Life, one of my favorite songs? Are they singing that? Maybe. Are they talking and laughing? Sure. Are they dancing? Not if they're Baptist. (laughs) But they're they're with Jesus in the fire. So what happens? Verse 26, then Nebuchadnezzar came near the door of the burning fiery furnace and he declared, I love this, listen, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, servants of what? Of who? The most high God. Now he's getting it. Come out and come here. Why? He has to call them out of the fire. Why? He can't go in. Can you imagine how silly this is? There's this big fire. They think it had two doors on the top and the bottom. He's looking at it and he's going, hey, can you guys come out of the fire? That's that's what's happening. And verse 27, the satraps, the prefects, the governors, the king's counselors gathered together and saw that the fire had what? Not had any power over the bodies of these men. The hair on their heads were not singed. Not too hard for me, but listen, that's okay. Their cloaks were not harmed and no smell of fire had come upon them. I can go sit in a barbecue place for an hour with a pastor and I smell like mesquite. They were in a fire a thousand degrees, didn't even smell like it. There's no, no effect on them. They were not harmed, no smell of fire come upon them. Verse 28, Nebuchadnezzar answered and said, Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who had sent his angel and delivered his servants. That's who God is. God delivers. He saves. That's who he is. He delivered his servants, what? Who trusted in him and set aside the king's command and yielded up their bodies rather than serve and worship any god except their own god. Verse 29, therefore I make a decree, any people, nation, or language that speaks anything against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego shall be torn limb from limb, and their houses laid in ruins, for there is no other God who is able to rescue in this way. Then the king promoted Shadrach, Meshach, the word literally means prosper, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the province of Babylon. So what can we see? Can we answer this question? Can I trust God in the fire? I believe we can. Here's the answer. You can trust God because he walks with you in the fire. As a believer, you can trust God because he walks with you in the fire. Listen, he's not off in the distance. He's not off in his yard, in his lawn chair, sipping sweet tea, playing Candy Crush on his phone. 
distracted and going, you'll be fine, you'll be fine, you'll be fine. He is with you. That's who God is. So how can we have faith? How can we trust God in the fire? Here's three things I think we can see. One, you got to commit to worship God before the fire comes. you got to commit to worship God before the fire comes. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego had decided in their hearts, even before a furnace, before Nebuchadnezzar, it doesn't matter. They were trusting God, period. They loved God that much and they trusted him. And so when this, they, they weren't letting any other things creep up, any other excuses, any other gods. Nothing got in the way of their devotion to their God. And listen, it doesn't matter if a furnace showed up. It doesn't matter if coronavirus showed up. It doesn't matter if anything else showed up. They were committed in their hearts, even before that happened, to trust God. How's your commitment level this morning? Is it fiery furnace level? I don't know if mine is. I'll be honest with you. We got to commit in our hearts before we even have fire in our life and walk through the fire. We got to commit before that to trust and follow God. There's a, a lot of fears in my life. I'm just going to admit it here. I got to be real on stage. One of those fears is dying on water. I do not want to die on water. Michelle wants to go on a cruise one day when I build enough courage, I'll take her. I've seen Titanic, I know how that ends. I don't like open water, dark water. I know Jason Voorhees lives in lakes. I mean, I just, I don't want any of that. And so I'm scared. My other fear, even greater than that, and I'm just being serious, is throwing up. I hate it. I don't know why. It's weird. I know. It's weird. I just, I don't like it. I hate it. I run from it. The kids start, I'm, I'm out of the room. I'm not kidding. You can ask them. It's true. I'm sorry. I'm a wimp. I, it just happens. And so one, one day we were in seminary in Fort Worth. Michelle and I were married. We didn't have any children yet, and our friends invited us over. And seminary housing is super small. And so we walked into the house, opened the door, walked in, and I see one of their kids there laying on the, on the floor with a bowl in front of them. A bowl. And, uh, and I was like, I know what's happening. And then sure enough, another kid with a bowl. We, we walk in, we, we walk through, like we zigzag through them, all right? And we get to the table, we sit down and we start eating. And they're like, hey, by the way, I think our kids have a stomach virus. Now, all of a sudden, this is my nightmare. I'm living it right now. This is my fiery furnace. <laughs> and I'm like, oh man, what do I do? I can, I can just peace out and leave. I, don't, I mean, I could do that. I could run away, that's fine too. But we sat there and ate in food prepared in stomach virus air, <laughs> kids with bowls in front of them that were used. I know it's right before lunch. I'm just telling you, it was grossing me out. But you know why I stayed? Because before we walked through that door, I made a commitment. Before we walk through the door of any fire, listen, are you committed to God first? Because listen, the fire is going to reveal our hearts. It's going to reveal our faith. We got to be prepared for that. Jesus is worth it. But the second thing, how can we trust God in the fire, is this. you got to keep your eyes on Jesus in the fire to become more like him. you got to keep your eyes on Jesus in the fire to become more like him. Here's what John Calvin, the theologian, said. He said, Jesus rescued them in the fire, not from the fire. Isn't that good? I didn't come up with that. That's okay. Jesus rescued them in the fire, not from the fire. He was there with them. Hear me. The whole point of this passage the whole focus of this passage is not on the fiery furnace. You know what it's on? The faith of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in Jesus, who was what? Walking with them in the fire. The God of the universe was there with them. And so what God says is this, God made promise to us. And in John 16, Jesus tells us the Holy Spirit, as believers, he's going to be with you always. He says in Joshua 1, he will never leave you nor forsake you. Aren't those incredible promises? The God of the universe is walking with you. This powerful, mighty God is with you in the fire. And what he wants us to do, here's what we do. Here's what I do. If it's just me, it's just me. Here's what we do is we focus on the fire, not Jesus with us. We say, God, why has this happened? Why have you done this? Why have you done this to me? And listen, nowhere in this text did God cause the fire. It's not his fault. Sometimes fire is caused because of our sin. Sometimes someone else, we just walk through fire. It's not his fault. 
But we focus on the fire and we want to blame God. And we want to shake our fists. And you say, Paul, you don't understand how much hurt I'm going through this morning. How bad this fire is hurting. Maybe I don't. But I do know this as a believer, God is there with you. Walking with you through this. All you have to do is just continue to trust him. Keep our eyes on him. James says, listen, James chapter 1 says that these, these testing of our faith, they produce endurance and maturity. So God wants you to grow during this fire. He wants you to keep your focus on him, not the fire. So listen, you're having some struggles in your marriage. What if you focus on Jesus first, not the problems? Yeah, you got to work them out. I understand. But what if you change your focus to Jesus? You got some financial problems, you're looking at those bills. Instead of focus on the bills, what if you focus on Jesus who can provide anything for you? Yes, you have to choose a treatment plan real soon, and those are important things, but what if you focus on Jesus who will give you the wisdom that you need in the fire? And you can become more like him even through the fire because he is with you. And here's the last thing. How can we have trust? How can we trust God in the fire? Number three, prove your loyalty to God by taking a step of faith in your dedication. Prove your loyalty to God by taking a step of faith in your dedication. These three men, they walked right into that fire. You know what? I, I was reading this and I thought, you know what? They could have... They the, the, the mighty men that threw them in, they burned up, right? So they should have died right there at the beginning if you think about it. Maybe they could have torn their, bind, their binding off and just said, I'm out, and run away. But they didn't. They just fell into the fire. They had that kind of faith. They took a step of dedication. What about you? Where is your dedication to God this morning? How dedicated are you? What about saying this? What about taking this kind of step of faith and dedication? What if we say, you know what, for the next three months, I'm going to attend church regularly. Oh, but Paul, next week we've got this. Oh, this has come up. Oh, but you don't understand uh, someone's playing on TV and I got to be there to watch it. And I, I just don't, three months, that's a long time to be there every week. What if you say, you know what, I'm going to give sacrificially and financially regularly. Well, Paul, we got some bills to pay. It's tough. Okay. Maybe you've been making excuses. You need to join that life group. You've been making excuses. Maybe now's the time to take that step of dedication. Maybe you need to go a walk across your cubicle to your friend. You know that you need to tell about Jesus. You've been making all these excuses. I don't know what they're going to say. I don't know what questions they're going to answer. I'm too worried. But listen, what if God tells you to do it and you need to take that step of faith, the dedication, and go to them? What about just waking up and reading your Bible every day and say, you know what, for the next 20 days, I'm just going to read every day. Start in the book of John and go. Maybe it's time to take that step. Maybe you need to be baptized. Maybe you need to join the church, whatever it may be. Maybe God is speaking to you this morning. You know, these men were an example. They loved Jesus so much. They loved God so much, man. They just took that step of faith. They took that step of faith and dedication. Maybe you need to take a step of faith and dedication this morning. In 1940, the British troops and some French troops were uh, well, the Nazis were taking over France and pushing their way through France, and they pushed the British troops all the way up into this corner into a town called Dunkirk. Maybe you've seen the movie. You know the story. And they were trapped. The British couldn't get to them in time, and so it was either fight or surrender. And they were going to fight. And so somehow the word got out that they needed help. And all these people, all these men and women, these families, they began to take their boats, come, and they rescued them. They rescued over 300,000 soldiers before the Germans got to them. But here's the thing. One of the British officers sent this message to London. Here's what he said. But if not. You know where that came from? Daniel Chapter 3. He said, you know what? If not, we're going to fight. If God delivers us, okay. If he doesn't, okay. Do we have that kind of faith? Do you have that kind of faith? Maybe you've been walking through the fire alone today. This week, for years. You know, this story is a story of salvation. 
You know, the Bible says that we are all sinners. We've fallen short. We've disobeyed God. And because of that, we deserve hell and death. And hell is a fiery furnace. But God doesn't want us to go there. So he had a plan. He sent his one and only son, Jesus. Jesus Christ came, put on flesh, lived a perfect life, and died for you and me, everyone, in our place on the cross, and rose again three days later to give us victory and salvation. And all you have to do, all I have to do is put our faith and trust in Jesus Christ, ask him to come into our life and be our Lord and Savior, our boss. Maybe that's something you need to do this morning in the time of response. Maybe you've made that decision, you've, you walk with Jesus and maybe you've pushed him away. You're walking through the fire and you've pushed God so far away in your life, that you feel like he's not there. But listen, he's there. Just because you don't feel him, we don't base everything on our feelings. But maybe it's time to take a step of dedication to him. Maybe it's a time to recommit. Maybe it's a time to focus on him and not the fire. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we love you and we thank you. We ask that you speak to us in this moment. Give us peace. Give us hope. We love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thanks for joining us today for our online worship service. God is doing so many things at Mission City Church that we would love for you to be a part of. Just go to missioncity.church to learn more. I also want to encourage you to worship today through giving. Click the Give button at the top of your screen and you can be a part of our mission in that way as we continue to see God transform lives here in San Antonio and online. We'll see you next week.